That's uh, 702. Let's go ahead and start the um, the uh, Jamaica Select Board for Monday, August the 13th. Um, our opening gambit is to call for any late additions to the agenda. Anyone have anything they wanted to add to the agenda? Hearing none, we'll move into number two. Approve the minutes of the July 23rd Select Board meeting. They were all electronically sent out, plus posted around. Um, any questions, additions, deletions? No. Hearing none, it sounds like they were acceptable. I make a motion to accept the July 23rd Select Board meeting. Yes. Have a second? Second. And any further conversation? Hearing none, these minutes are accepted. Thank you, ma'am. Aye. Oh, yeah. Okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? That motion passes. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me straight. I try. It's a hard job. <laughs> Somebody has to do it. Somebody's got to center. Number three, approve the timesheets for the town office listeners highway and transfer station. We do that after the uh, session, historically, save people other time. Sign the select board orders. We'll do that as well. Number five on tonight's agenda is uh, we have joining us tonight, Sheriff Keith Clark from the Windham County Sheriff's Department. And um, did you want to make a, a statement first or did, no? I prefer not to. I, I really don't have a statement to make. Okay. I'd be more than happy to talk about my office and answer any questions you may have. Sure. There's some questions that you have. We talked about. Um, coverage of what kind of things these are doing. Yeah, we had talked about that. What what sort of things that, that, that the William County Sheriff does versus the state the state troopers? Um, just trying to clarify. Uh, so, any service we provide to you is based upon whatever the, our current contract is. So, um, our contract, um, because of past discussions between my office and the town of, of Jamaica, uh, our focus has been on traffic enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, but there's other things that I'll go over the stats for the past year. Um, so that's been our, our primary focus, but that, there are other times with the board, um, usually through Lexa, when she was the liaison with Conseil, we have a concern about a particular thing, or we, have, we need a resource or support, and we would do that. Um, when that occurs, it's going to, it's likely to reduce the number of patrol hours for that month or the following month, because we, we try to schedule around the known number of hours in a month. Um, some of the things that uh, we've done, we've done everything from littering complaints to helping you with traffic surveys um, to help establish speed limits. Um, so the difference between my office and the state police is how we're funded. Uh, the state police are fully funded. That's where your state tax dollar goes. Uh, my office is not state funded and we're not county funded either. Uh, everything that we do has to be based upon a contract. Um, it, and with a couple of exceptions. I have two deputies who are in t whose uh, salary is paid for by the state for the primary purposes of prisoner transports. Um, so they are scheduled 40 hours a week to move people basically from Springfield to Brattleboro Court and back. Um, we do move them around the state. Um, and my salary is paid for by the, by the state as a constitutional officer. Uh, the county does provide some support for my office. Statutorily, they have to pay for a bookkeeper to keep track of the money that goes in and out of my office and an administrative assistant. Uh, they pay for some insurances, um, some training, and, few, and the building that I'm in. They cannot pay for deputies and they cannot pay for cars. They can't. All of that has to come out of those contractual costs. Um, can we all do the same type of investigations? Yes, we all have, we all have the same level of training. We're all what we call Vermont Level Three certified, which means we've been to the full time academy uh, and have that training. What it comes down to is, do you want to pay me to do an eight hour you know burglary investigation when the state has you know the Bureau of Criminal Investigations or detectives to do that? It doesn't make sense for you to you know to pay us, but we're already paying the state to do. What we do is basically provide a, a supplemental service to the town. The town wants more patrol time, they want to focus on traffic enforcement, you want someone available if you have a need to support. Uh, your health officer uh, wants to go do an inspection of a home uh, and they want law enforcement presence when they do that. Uh, we often support uh, a, a town's health officer if there's been a dog bite case and they want someone to go with them. 
um, just to, to keep them safe. We will do that and support. And that's established in your contract. Uh, you know, we, we can make those sort of uh, on-the-fly adjustments to the, to the schedule uh, when, when they come up. So that's, those are the big differences. It's how we're funded and what the expectations are of our offices. So we all have the same type of training. Okay. We have some, we've had some squatters in town. Would that be something you could help us with? And we could talk about it offline, of course, in detail. Absolutely, because okay. there, there's two aspects to that. One is a criminal aspect, depending on where they're squatting, whether it's trespassing or not. That there's also a civil component. The one thing that my office does is we handle civil enforcement. So if you were to get a court order to say you know, that they have to, they have to leave, we would enforce that. The state police do not enforce civil orders. Okay. Okay. That, that goes through my office. So okay. Those kind of things, yeah, we certainly can, can help you with and okay. provide you guidance to, to help you get through to where you want to be. Uh, that's not uncommon for us to deal with. Okay. Those, those kind of so you would do the civil piece and then potentially do a criminal piece yep. if they were squatting. Absolutely. I mean, okay. so one of the things, I mean, we do, you know, if you, you know, everything from the, the notice um, to vacate all the way through a, a formal eviction, that, that is what we do. Okay. And who would I contact at your office? Uh, you can go and ask for me. In my absence, ask for Lieutenant Jessica Fellows. Jessica. Uh, Jessica. Mm -hmm. Mark Anderson, my second command right now, is, is deployed overseas with this guard unit. But any one of us can point you in the, okay. right, or the right direction. But, Thank um, you. Of course, like I said, probably the best way to reach me is just send me an email. Um, I'm on the road a lot. I'm more likely to respond to an email than a voicemail even <laughs> stuck in the loop in my office. Aren't you, aren't you our liaison? I am the liaison. Yes. That's what I was asking. Mm -hmm. so, yes, and I've worked with Jessica in Mark's. I've talked to Mark before he was deployed, but he's like, I'm leaving in two days. <laughs> and I, he said, talk to Jessica. So I have worked with Jessica. Yeah. She, she's done a phenomenal job doing not only her regular duties, but filming in for him. Uh, May I ask when you expect him back, or does he know? I know uh, that they don't always know when they... First part of November. Okay. Uh, October, November, oh. somewhere in that time frame. So, um, looking forward to having him back. Thank you. Um, I think we have 80 hours. Is that what? What I is our other hours? hours? I think it's. Uh, I think it's just over 20 hours per week. It's about 80 yeah, hours. Eight okay, hours. I thought it was around 80 hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what I did, and I apologize, I don't have enough copies for the folks in the audience. I did run out your, your stats for the last uh, fiscal year. Um, so where it says July, this would have been last July, not, not this past month. Um, I apologize, it's not a color. We need to have a lot of here. But I'll just go through these real quick. Um, but you'll see that the, the primary focus has been in traffic enforcement. But there are some other things that we've handled for you. Um, we've handled a total, and again, this includes traffic complaints on um, traffic enforcement. A total of uh, 347 incidents. Um, as you can see by the chart on the first page on the, on the upper left, again, the vast majority of those were traffic stops. Yeah. Um, agency assist, that could be anything from assisting your health officer to assisting DCF if they're going to remove a child from a home, or the state police are here and they ask us to, to back them up on a call. Uh, sometimes, you know, fire departments in a lot of times ask for us to respond, um, particularly for medical calls, particularly during this, the opiate issues we have. Uh, they're really concerned about their safety. I don't blame them. And for a bit, we will back them up before they go into a home. Um, so it's a little hard to, to see because your copy is not in color. Um, then down below, it's it's by month. Uh, you know, the busier month. As you can see, October uh, of last year uh, was the busiest month. But that's where we're trying. We know that your traffic increases in the following year. And so we tried to sort of establish our presence. Uh, and at one point, what we were doing is we didn't provide you quite the same number of hours in the in the summer months, knowing that. And this year, we're we're trying to stay right around 80 hours per month. Um, if there's month, you know. so that's why if you look at July of last year, it was, it, there was fewer incidents because we just weren't here as many hours. Uh, and then we made that up in, in the fall and winter um, when it really seemed that was the what the town wanted us to focus on. But I think uh, the last conversation, it, it may have even um, uh, been with you and Mark about sort of make sure we balance that out through the summer because you still do have traffic here in the summertime. So 
if, if you want to come back on March and come here in three months, and you'll see we were pretty busy during during the summer, June, July, and, and even now into August. Um, so again, in October, we put in a pretty strong presence, a lot of stops, same in November. December, it tailed off a little bit. You know, sometimes that in December, it's weather-related. You know, we're not going to put in a lot of, make a lot of stops when it's snowing. You know, we're just, you know, we may not even come out. It doesn't mean, you know, if, if the weather's really bad, we try to put guys on the road just to respond to accidents and just locate them down by presence. Not necessarily stopping cars in a snowstorm. That's not a really good idea. So those are the numbers. Uh, and then down below, what we did is just broke it out by you know, different types of calls that we did respond to. And I'll answer any question I have about those. And most of those are, are pretty, pretty light. Uh, and again, you'll see that the number of traffic stops was 304. And if you flip to uh, the last page, uh, you'll see how that's broken out by, by stop. Um, so again, we had 304 traffic stops with 258 tickets issued. Uh, everything from using a portable uh, device, someone talking on their cell phone or texting while driving, uh, all the way down through uh, speeding. If you notice, the vast majority of your speeding offenses are 11 to 20 miles per hour over. <coughs> the last time I looked, the average was around 60 miles per hour over the speed limit. That's uh, crazy. That's yeah. significant for five miles to town. Right. And the the ones where it says <coughs> one to ten, that when I look at the, the, the my spot check, those are some that's doing twelve to thirteen and the deputy wrote it for ten over trying to get them down, you know, for whatever reason, um, they have that, that ability. Um, but we're not writing someone for doing one or two over. Uh, so the, again the majority of them are the, that much higher speed and, they, and even now that about 10 percent or even higher 21 to 30. that's most of those are right here through the village area yeah. there's some up above uh, and a few below and some of the side roads um, hopefully no one's doing 30 miles an hour you never know, quite fall from them, but. <laughs> you never, you never know. Uh, i know we really tried in many different ways over at least the time that i've been on the board uh, to work at trying to reduce the amount of those speed within the village, putting up some signs. I know we had it stopped and all of that kind of thing, and really not a whole lot works. It, you no, know, it, it, it takes a combination of all of that. Um, and, and I can't remember if it was this board or another board, is that your highway departments do a great job. Uh, the roads are a little wider, the sight distances are, are longer, the curves are not as sharp, but all of those changes to make our roads safer also make them faster. Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, when you can see further, you know that you don't have to worry about an upcoming bend, um, you know, there's all that space, the roads are smoother, people tend to go faster. And so you know, tell your highway department to make the roads narrower, put the sharp curves, <laughs> let the trees over the road, and people will slow down. Um, it's basically slowing people down to environmental design, but then you're going to get the complaints. The road's too rough and I can't see. It's that balance. Um, it, you know, we've brought out our, you know, we have uh, portable radar carts that flash. And, um, those work for a while in some areas just to remind people. Those are good. I, that's one of my key things. You know, you think like, oh, I'm just trying this. Oh, my God. <laughs> that one's in the new phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the one in the new phase, we've got, we've got to move. Um, right now, I also have one in uh, Putney that we're about to move. So if, if you feel that there, like, um, you have an event coming up and you'd like us to put it out a couple of weeks before the event, we can move it around. Um, again, you can reach out to Jess or I. Dana Shepherd, Sergeant Shepherd from my office, normally sets those up and move them. Uh, they're also supposed to capture uh, statistical data. Supposed to. Sometimes the system doesn't quite work right. But it's supposed to take, you know, the, whether it's a you know, car, truck, direction of travel and speed. So that's helpful t to know. You know, what it, you know is it, and then also time of day. So is it coming through day, night, middle day, school days? So there's a question in the back. Yeah. I, uh, over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, what's happening with the mobile homes that have been coming? They come through 40, 50 miles an hour. We've um, we've actually reached, I've reached out, um, my two sergeants have reached out, Lieutenant Fellows has reached out to not only the state police, we've, I've actually talked to Lieutenant French 
um, but also the head of commercial or the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, what has happened is, is a couple of things. Is as they pay 103, they're issuing. They don't want the trucks over there, so they're issuing the permits to come through here. Uh, and for some reason, some of these are not being escorted by law enforcement. Right. The ones that we escort, we we make it very clear we have to stay below speed limit. It's actually five miles below that. Um, but we have noticed, the same as you've noticed, that these are coming through without escorts. Yes. And some of yes. Um, and also, I've even seen some running in convoy when it's two or more running yes. back out. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not supposed to do that either. Uh -huh. So we again, we've spoken to DMV. Uh, they've asked their DMV inspectors to spend a little more time out here, uh, and also to talk. It's I think it's two different companies, but they've reached out to them to say, look, you know, we're issuing these permits. These are the rules, and they're so part of it is education, um, and part of it is enforcement. How long will this go on? That I don't know. Like, so um, I know it's temporary. And there's something in Bennington as well, isn't there? That's right. So yeah, they're paving um, all of Route 9 um, from the Wilmington line all the way to downtown Bennington through right. Woodford. Uh, that project actually started a couple of years ago. So again, the two routes north and south of you um, are really limited to overlink traffic. Mm -hmm. So you should see a drop off. Uh, 103, that project's probably going to go into almost November. It's a 48 mile paving project. Um, but Route 9, probably Route 9, someplace they just can't make that the swing through those curves. I mean, they're really dangerous. I live right on the corner of the bridge, and I've seen them. I, I know that one of your cars was forced out of the way when one of them came down. Yeah, we have, we have the same. We see them going by our office right. at, at Speed to I. We, we've gone out and, and stopped them. Mm -hmm. um, have they been summoned? Yeah, some of the drivers have been issued, but it's never, it seems, from what I've seen, it's not the same drivers. Mm -hmm. you know, so, um, I would think if there were enough of them, they would get back to the company. Yeah, I think the word's starting to get back, but again, it was early in the, right around when they started to pave 103, the right. April, May time range, when we saw the increase. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that are um, even the larger sort of multi-park homes, we've actually helped through some of the escorts through the system mm -hmm. of to do those. Um, but it is concerning not, not only the speed, um, but how much lean width they're taking up. Well, I've seen cars swerve, and there's no room. When you come down to make a hill here, yeah, there's no room to swerve around them. Yeah. We had that happen uh, in the Townsend area, where we were forced, and it was on a bridge, and they were coming right down center line and there was no way for us to even get over any farther because we had the bridge to deal with. So it, it is, they really are very dangerous. They are. Um, it, it, and again, they're right at that, if, from what I've seen, the ones that I've seen without escorts, they're right at that edge between what is re, whether required to have blue light or law enforcement escorts. Uh -huh. I've even, I stopped one. He didn't even have the yellow light escorts. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, yeah. how to... You have a question? Yeah, just to address one of your concerns, uh, was that um, perhaps, you know, that radar cart, is that what you call it? Yeah. I, I, you know, as I said, I find those a little effective, maybe setting one up. And if you want to give people one day warning or whatever on it, I don't know how the law works with that, but you'd set the thing up, you know, and then basically have some teeth behind it, you know, at the end of the town, you still need to be doing 15 miles an hour over and you decided not to slow down, so we're going to take Yeah, the, the, the only, and I understand where you're going with that, um, the problem with that is, uh, unlike the radars that are in, car, in our car that are certified and tested every day, that car is not. Right. Um, so we, we could not use that for enforcement purposes. Right. Um, but the other thing it actually helps with is when people say they're, you know, and I'm not disagreeing that these trucks are going too fast, but we've had them say that I think they're going way too fast past my home. And then when they realize larger vehicles have looked like they're going faster than they actually are. And um, that actually helps people to say, you know what, yeah, they're, they're doing 40 in the 35 or 30, but they're not doing 60 miles an hour. But they're doing 50. Um, we actually had a, a person claim that said right here in Jamaica, uh, she said that they were doing, you know, 50 to 55, and she actually sat in my car with my deputy and tried to estimate the speeds of trucks. 
and she tend to be 10 to 50 miles higher than the actual speeds. Mm -hmm. So okay, the other the other issue is not only the mobile homes; it's also tandem loggers that are coming down, and they can't seem to slow up in time. Yeah, we, we have written we have written the logging trucks, mm -hmm. yeah. and those are another thing where we. Um, if we, we see those, we'll reach out to the Department of Motor Vehicles because they have the specialized training around the weight of those. Um, and they'll bring in inspectors, particularly early in the morning, late in the afternoon when they're moving those loads to weigh the trucks to make mm -hmm. sure that they're uh, at or below the, the legal limit. Mm -hmm. um, those, those logs tend to be wet and very heavy. And a lot of times, the tr I think the truck drivers know they're heavy. They don't realize how heavy they are as compared to what's legal. Um, so that's where we... One of the things that we can do is reach out to our partners. So it doesn't cost you anything to have the DMV inspectors out. Uh, really, when we reach out to them, you know, like Mark Hebert or Mark Kern Alberta, um, the head of DMV enforcement, they may need your help um, and they put an additional presence. So don't disagree with me. Do they, they, can, can the DMV revoke the permits? They can. Theoretically, I mean, that would be the guy, that would be the, the, yep. the uh, last. Or, or add additional restrictions to say, you know, we tried to allow you to run the just yellow lights, but now you can't move at all from the New York line through Vermont unless you have blue and oh. yellow lights. Um, <coughs> we've had them where uh, they'll say, you know, you have to meet your blue light escort at a location, and when they get there, DMV is there to do a level one inspection. Mm -hmm. And they don't like that because one, it's time consuming and there's a risk that that load doesn't move and they're losing money. Um, it, it sounds a little heavy handed, but you know, DMV, you know, it's, they want those trucks to move safely through. And if they're not following the rules, let's make sure they're doing Because chances are, if they're speeding, they're not doing other things safely. You know? um, and my deputies are, are learning that. Um, they're learning how to do the walk arounds. And, and, most companies that we do escort, they want to follow, they want to be safe. The last thing they want is a crash where um, someone gets injured or significant property damage. They want to do the right thing. This company, I don't know if they've had this huge order of mobile homes or what's going on, but it, I, it's more than what we normally see in, in the summertime. Thank you. Your question? Just one comment. Sure. Uh, I got behind one of those right here in Jamaica and I had to follow them all the way in WW. And that guy didn't go over 35 miles an hour in one of those old homes. And when cars were coming at him, he moved over so far that he was inside the white line. And I don't know why people were coming to a complete stop meeting him in a total panic. He was, this guy was not speeding and he was totally on his side of the road. I, there was no way I could ever get around him because, but he was, he may have hit 40 a couple places. But I was surprised how far he dared to move over just to get away from the yellow line. It, I mean, it, I've seen them whipping down through here too, but they see a lot of cars coming down. Right. See a lot of, I just want to say that I think the Sheriff's Department and our primary law enforcement, state police, there's more of a presence of them in the past few years, unless it's just yeah. my imagination. I would agree with that. And they're stopping people. And we try to, to work as, as close as we can with our VSP partners to make sure that you know we're not both out here at the same time, um, or we work with them under a grant program. Where, you know, we're out trying to get DUIs at night, those kind of things. We work together. We have probably right now the best relationship I've seen in 12 years between my agency and VSP and our other partners. It's, it's really nice. After it took a lot of work, mm -hmm. um, but it's a great community. Anytime something calls up, comes up, I can call Lieutenant French or call him, or, and uh, that's alleviated a lot of, I think, a lot of confusion for the community that, that we're able to do that now. Thank you very much. Is it anything else you want to throw at us? Um, just a, a couple of things that I'm always advertising. We do still have our Are You OK program. Um, it's really set up for elderly folks that live alone. Um, what happens is we have a system that will call them every morning. Um, when the system's down, a dispatcher, it's a live call. Sometimes they just do that anyway. To say, are you okay? Uh, if no one answers the phone, we call their key holder, someone that on the list. Mm -hmm. uh, that if there's no one available, either law enforcement or sometimes we'll even reach out to rescue. Say, could you go check on them? Um, it's just a way to make sure people truly are okay. And uh, th there's no cost to that. Um, there's a short, it's like a one-page application, um, address where your key holders are, who to call if something happens. Um, and so I'd ask people if you know you have an elderly neighbor that's living alone or 
Um, they don't necessarily have to be elderly, but if it's someone that has a, um, they, they're not able to get around very well, or for some just are living alone, we can do that for you. I'm not sure that um, senior, whatever the name of it, senior citizens um, know about that program. I haven't heard anything. Because they, they have come, I go to the luncheon that they have. I'd be happy to talk about it, but I've yeah. talked to a lot of folks for the last 12 years. Um, that would be, I, I, I know the person uh, who we should be contacting around that. So uh, maybe I'll call your office and. Call, call my office. The information is also available yeah. on our website. Okay. Yeah. What's the program called? Are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah. yeah. Just like the letters. Oh. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the other programs we're running it actually started with a, a, a very nice grant from State Farm Insurance. Uh, I know Steve has worked uh, with our deputy on this. We have a deputy that does, uh, it's an enhanced teen driver safety program. We work with the local high schools and driver ed program um, to sort of talk about the stuff that drivers ed doesn't cover. Uh, and it's worked out, it's a help develop relationship between law enforcement and teenagers. Teens are, um, hey, cops are not bad guys, they're trying to educate us. Uh, out of that grant, we purchased three high-end driving simulators that are mobile. Um, we bring them to the schools, the kids get to you know, use them, and then it actually prints out a report that we can send home to mom and dad and say, you know, Johnny tends to break too soon entering a corner, or he's taking quite a while, he's not taking it. So it, get, it helps the parents sort of coach their kids through learning how to drive. Um, and then there's actually a meeting that occurs between uh, the, the deputy and the parents, as a parent meeting to sort of talk about all the things that parents need to think about as, as their teens learn to drive. Um, and one of the things that, that Mike Roy, he's retired from the state police who does this program for us, um, typically it's early in their junior year that they're doing this, and then towards the tail end of their senior year, so it's been almost two years, they do sort of a survey to see, and they're retaining about 85 to 90% mm -hmm. of the information. Uh, and so a lot of positive feedback, not only from the, from the kids, but from the parents. Wow, wish this program existed when I tried teaching his brother or sister how to drive, or when I was learning, it was good. Mm -hmm. So the simulator gives them a chance to um, simulate to change to night driving, inclement weather, all sorts of things can be added to it. So it's just a way for them to safely learn how to control a car without putting anybody at risk. And again, that's a program that right now is being supported through Governor's Highway Safety Education Grant. So there's no cost to the schools or the kids to do the program. And that also re increases good relationship between families and the Sheriff's Department. And it's just law enforcement in general to say, you know, I have a question. Yeah. What does happen if I get stopped for speeding as a 16-year-old and yeah. I get a ticket? Um, you know, what are you know, some of the factors around driving that we don't, we don't normally think about? Well, sometimes sheriffs are perceived as enemies rather than... Yeah, my deputies think I'm the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> so is that part of the driver's ed program or is that after the driver's <clears throat> it's, it's actually, they, they integrate it into the driver ed okay. program. Because I saw Officer Roy speak and actually did for very... My son just got his license and <laughs> so went through the whole thing. So yeah. I was just curious if I could push him to say, go go do this program, but he's always probably already done it. Probably already has it. So, yep, it's integrated in. So right okay. now we're doing Wheeling and Gray, uh, Deerfield Valley, uh, over the Wellington and Dover area, Bradbury High School, uh, Springfield. We do not do uh, Green Mountain and Chester because they don't have a driver ed program. It's a subcontract. But Mike does work with that driver ed instructor also. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other, any other questions? I hate to rush off, but I have to get over rocking you, so see you don't want to miss your presentation. It's <laughs> nice to see you. I'll be sure. additional copies. Sure. You can have the original one. Sure. One more I'd be happy to. If you need any other information, let me know. And I'll have Jess print it out because I don't know how to look it up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks. <coughs> okay. The next on the agenda tonight, we have a presentation from West River Rock. So that's several months ago. And uh, we. This is the schedule time we were able to put up. Thank you, Paul. And thanks to the select board for inviting me tonight. Paul and I met a month or two ago. Uh, I've been reaching out to some of the towns and doing these presentations little by little. 
And what uh, I'm the new director of West River Valley Thrives, who are a substance use education and prevention organization. And I'd like to start with my short presentation by letting you know what we do do, which I hope informs you on what we don't do. Because uh, I think the important part of what I just said is that uh, there has been some misconception about our work. And that part of that misconception is you're a prohibition organization. We are not a prohibition organization. What is legal is legal. What we are is an education organization. And as you can see here, primarily based with youth. And I want to add a little bit to what Sheriff Clark said, because we do work closely with Mike Roy, who, uh, who is part of what we call our sector representatives. What we, we are doing is we've been in the area uh, since 2012, First of all, under a Holt grant, which some of you may know of, the Holt sisters who provide, who have set up a foundation, and they gave us the opportunity to write a grant which uh, now gives us an annual grant from, uh, through drug-free communities in the Office of National Drug Control Policy. It's a result of the Holt Foundation here in, in the Upper West River Valley. Excuse me, is there any way you can make that bigger? I can't, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. So yeah, I'm like, sorry. Come on in and move closer, please. Yeah, I, I made it as big as I can unless I push this back. So I knew I came in in November. The organization has been around for a while, and what I'm doing right now is, as the director, is reaching out to the communities in my role. We also have a project coordinator who carries out many of our activities, and many of those activities take place right inside the school. We rent space from Leland and Gray, and we have great access to the kids. So Tom, you've probably seen your son yep. in the Enhanced Teen Driver Safety Program. Going back to Mike Roy, uh, we have, I am building a coalition. That coalition is based on what we call 12 sectors. It's a wheel that looks like it's divided into pie sectors. And we get coalition involvement agreements signed from individuals in healthcare, parents, youth, youth serving organizations, schools, faith-based organizations, civic organizations, and we meet about once every two months. And last month we met on adverse childhood experiences. So some of the meetings are just informational and how adverse childhood experiences, which is some research that has been done nationally, how that contributes to things like substance use and abuse among our youth and other mental illnesses and psychiatric issues. I'm getting off the point. Let me, let me point out here what we focus on. Increased student knowledge of the harmful effects of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Decreased student acceptance of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. The increased student perception that community norms discourage alcohol. What's interesting about that is we do a survey every year at Leland and Gray, or every other year, and the other year, uh, a, a survey is done called Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is a national survey carried out by the Center for Disease Control. It's very interesting to see what perceptions are. I'm going to show a slideshow very shortly, which shows some of the statistics. Increased youth participation in healthy activities. So our education and our programs are not just involved in, in teaching youth about the harmful effects of drugs and alcohol, but we're really trying to focus on how can we make communities healthier? And we know we can't do that alone, which links back to building coalitions in our community of individuals. So how do we make our communities healthier? By involving all sectors of the community. One reason why I'm here to let you know what we do, to let you know that you can give us a call if you're interested in coming to our meetings, if you need subject matter experts on anything, we're here, and we would love to talk to you more, make presentations. I'll turn around to that near the end of my presentation. Some, are, some of our strategies. We coordinate a group at the school called Above the Influence. When I first came in as the director of West River Valley Thrives, there were four students involved in our Above the Influence group. That's a special group of students that meets once a week in our office, middle school and high school students, and we do a lot of fun activities. Obviously, they're all substance-free, whether they're in school or out of school. But a lot of it's fun. But then we have education uh, events as well. We now have over 20 students, and it's growing. 
They're, they're really involved. This year, we sponsored five students in an essay contest to go to a, a three-night, four-day youth-to-youth national conference in Rhode Island, which is just on leadership skills. It has nothing to do with substance use, but when you're teaching things like healthy lifestyles and leadership and relationship building, all these things contribute to a decrease in substance use. We hold our regular coalition meetings. We host forums on important issues. At the end of September, I'm going to be calling Keith. We're hoping to host a forum at the Dutton Gym in Townsend, or possibly if we need a larger event, on the new marijuana law. We've been getting a lot of calls on the new marijuana law. People are confused. And we are, we're certainly, we are not against the new marijuana law. What's legal is legal, but what we want to do is we want to educate about it. And we want to make sure that people are well educated about it. And we also want to make sure that our, our youth who are underage are not using marijuana. Because marijuana use is on the rise. As is vaping. It's skyrocketing. Are, are you familiar with vaping and e-cigarettes? And students are now doing it in the schools. It's smokeless. It's smellless. And one of these pods of e-cigarettes contains the equivalent of one pack of cigarettes of nicotine. In them. And some of these students will go through one of those in a day, 13, 14, 15 year olds, getting addicted to nicotine. And they look like USB ports, just like this, right here in my computer. Plug it right in, just like that. And we work collaboratively with a lot of other organizations. Getting back to the forum we want to do at the end of September, I want to try to get some local legislators, law enforcement, state police, uh, Lieutenant French, individuals from the schools, and if any of you, any individuals in the towns are interested in joining the panel, talking about the new marijuana law, and then answering questions, we're going to open this up and advertise it throughout Wyndham County and schedule it for the end of September sometime um, over at Dutton Gym. Let me switch over to my presentation. My presentation is primarily on this planning primer, which Paul, I believe, I gave you one and then I, I dropped some off in the office. This is a, a document that was put together uh, primarily by the Women Regional Commission. And if you've had the opportunity to read through it, you'll see that this is, is in no way says, we recommend that you create ordinance and laws around substances. What it does do is it recommends some really healthy language that you can put into your town plans. I know Jamaica approved the town plan last year, is that it? So you've been for eight years. I would nevertheless like to follow up my meeting here where I introduce some of our work in this prevention plan primer with a, another meeting with the planning commission, if that would be okay to contact your planning commission. You can certainly ask them. Yeah, and have a, have a meeting with them. So uh, quickly on the prevention primer and some of the statistics that we're seeing. So the purpose of it is not to restrict or mandate municipalities to take action, but to provide staff and volunteers with new options and ideas based on what's most important for their community. And we can provide technical assistance in that capacity. Why should towns think about planning for prevention? Because Towns shape public spaces, and public spaces shape us. So with the new marijuana law coming into effect, you know, a lot of, we, we serve the Wyndham Central Supervisory Union, so the seven towns and villages of this area. And our area, there are four prevention coalitions in Wyndham County. We're the most rural one. Uh, all of them have town centers. We really don't have one big business district here in this area, but if you, if you give it some thought ahead, and with the marijuana law, does Jamaica want, say, a marijuana dispensary downtown at some point in the future? Something to give some thought to. And do they want it close to your elementary school, if, it is, if a marijuana dispensary would be coming? Uh, do you have language in your town plan that states how many feet from public spaces you should be smoking or not smoking? Uh, things like that that you may want to consider. Perception of harm is something I alluded to earlier. So 
I find this kind of interesting. This comes off of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, and it's, it's drilled down the whole way to Leland Gray School. So this is 9th through 12th graders. 36 and 39% of our 9th through 12th graders at Leland and Gray believe there's either a great risk or a moderate risk of binge drinking. That's pretty significant, so they recognize that. But look what happens when we go to marijuana. Greater moderate risk. You're now dropping from 75% to 50%. They don't think marijuana is as harmful. And then when you go to cigarettes, they think marijuana is less harmful than cigarettes. But of course, cigarette use is way down. This doesn't take into account what's happening with vaping these days. The conversations we have, the perception of teachers in the school. We, we had open discussions in classrooms at Leland and Gray, and many of those students really see no harm with vaping. They say, well, I'm not putting smoke in my lungs. You're not, but at 15 years old, you're getting addicted to nicotine, is what's happening. But this is, a, to me, this is a real interesting one, especially with our marijuana law coming into effect. Uh, some other statistics. So past 30 day use of alcohol and marijuana. So now we can compare US averages to Vermont, Windham County, and Leland Gray. So past 30 day use of alcoholic beverages, 32.8% of ninth through 12th graders in the US, 33% of Vermont were a little bit above national average, 34% in Windham County, almost 36% at Leland Gray are being shrinking in the past 30 days. Smoking marijuana, 21, almost 22% in the US, 24% in Vermont, 27% in Wyndham County. And we're, we're lower than Wyndham County, but still higher than the national average of past 30 day use of marijuana. This, uh, I'll spend five seconds with this really. This just takes a look at the, at the, the different levels that we get involved in the community. On the individual level, building relationships with teens and parents. Parents is really going to be one of our big focuses. Very difficult to get parents involved. But we want to try to have more informational events and try to get some, some groups put together. On the organizational level, we're involved with many different organizations. Part of this is trying to build relationships, just to let you know who I am and who we are and where we are. Come and stop in if you have questions. Give me a call. Uh, send me an email. My email's on the list. On the community level and with policies and systems. Though we obviously don't write policies, we can certainly act as subject matter experts in those areas. Speaking of which, we, we also offer resources. So, uh, I have a relationship with the elementary school principals and we'll be reaching out to them if they need any new signs for their schools. We can offer those signs and order them through the Vermont Department of Health. If you wanted to put up signs anywhere for smoke-free zones, we also have other stickers that you can do for smoke-free zones. These are our uh, resources we offer. We also offer all sorts of, of informational material marijuana information for students and parents, safe disposal of prescription drugs information, tobacco information, information for parents on influence, and again, information on safe disposal of prescription drugs, prescription drugs being a gateway we know statistically to heroin use. So you're really not seeing heroin use among our youth in the element in, in the ninth through 12th grade, but what you're seeing, in, there's a, another national study called the Young Adult Survey. And in that young adult survey from 18 to 25 year olds, that's where you're seeing people move from opioid use to heroin use. And I think many of us have heard of some of the negative effects of opioids and heroin in our area. So these resources are free. You're welcome to, uh, I'll leave some with you. And if you would like, there's many, many more resources that we have if you'd like to just place them on the counter at, at your, your office. I'll quickly try to move through the rest of this and then and, and, and this and the questions. Uh, this is just an example of what Guilford did, for example, in their town plan. Just some verbiage relating around building healthy communities. So they, they talk about the business environment. That, that's another thing that we're very cognizant of, that, that our work 
actually, we work with the businesses in the area and, and help them educate and put stars on their door if they've passed um, quality checks about how they're selling tobacco and alcohol. Uh, we're certainly a pro-business organization. We're not looking at taking alcohol out of stores. Um, but a town might want to look at how you're also building vibrancy in your citizenry, healthy families, multidisciplinary education, opportunities for communities and youth and its adults, things like that. So part of what we're doing, and we can't do this alone, is having after-school events for, for students. Um, um, work facilitating the Community Hope and Action Group in Townsend, which does substance-free events once a month. Uh, working with Grace Cottage Hospital in various ways. So some regulatory actions that, that you could possibly consider would be restricting or limiting availability. One thing would be is the consideration of, do you want a marijuana dispensary in your town in the next few years? If that would be a possibility. Enhancing ordinances with addendums or just just language which says we import we support healthy lifestyles. Uh, here are some examples of municipal regulations that have uh, been done. For example, smoking so many feet from public entrances in front of establishments with no smoking signs. And then non-regulatory actions, uh, we can provide signage. There's the prescription drop-off box at the sheriff's office. We're also going to be providing at Grace Cottage uh, prescription drug take-back envelopes. So when you go to the hospital and are either picking up medications or just going for an appointment and you have expired medications, there will soon be envelopes available where you can pop those expired medications into an envelope and mail them. And then, how easy are different substances to attain? Here's, I'll, I'll end with this particular statistic. So another one, this comes off of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Look how it changes with age. So when it comes to alcohol, a ninth grader feels, well, it's a little bit more difficult. But by the 12th grade, there feel, 74% of our 12th graders here feel it's pretty easy to obtain alcohol in the area. Marijuana, 68% from a 43% when they're in ninth grade to 68% by the time they're in 12th grade. And then with cigarettes, it's going higher. But again, what we're really finding is cigarette use is really down. It's, cigarette use is becoming less and less of a problem. It's, it's all about vaping these days. And they may be doing it, and, and you have no idea that they're doing it. And, and the, the other part of it is there are vaping devices where they come apart and then you can buy THC oils, which the other part of marijuana these days is, is the strength of the marijuana, extremely strong. And you can put the, the liquid THC into the device, smokeless, smellless, and you're smoking an extremely potent type of It of is the, uh, in terms of damage to the lungs, are there any studies on that in terms of vaping as opposed to smoking? Yeah, and that question, good question, it comes up often, and you know, this is one of those things where back in the 50s, what sort of cigarette research did they have? It was new, I'm not quite sure. We know that there are chemicals in, in vaping products that you probably shouldn't be ingesting, but the research is so new right now. So what we really, our prevention coalitions have talked about this a lot. Right now we're focusing on the amount of nicotine that teenagers are getting addicted to. Does this nicotine a product of tobacco? No, yeah. it's no, no, it's a liquid product. It, it actually vaporizes the What's device. What's it derived from though? Pardon? What's it derived from? Is it created chemically or is No, it I think it's a, a, a natural nicotine. It's not a chemical nicotine, but it's in a liquid form. Right. And then the vaping device actually has a heating element which vaporizes. Yeah, so it must come from something that has nicotine. So, that so probably, that. yes, it probably comes from tobacco, but you are not directly ingesting tobacco. Right. I think I think I heard once in the class that if you took a pure drop of nicotine, it's, uh, it's, it's poisonous. It's like that. you could kill it one drop of just pure. You could Google it, but there are these devices that I spoke about that you can take apart, and they actually, I believe, are now illegal. We were just talking about this earlier in the week, so I don't have all the details. There have been situations of teenagers taking this liquid and drinking it and dying from it. 
Yeah. Well, okay, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And please reach out. I didn't bring my business cards, I'm sorry, but my email is there. Mm -hmm. I'll be contacting your planning commission and doing another presentation there. Thank I'll you very much. I will give it to you. Rebecca's going to be leaving here soon, but I'll try to try catch her tomorrow, maybe. And, or somebody on the, on the planning commission, too. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Any other questions? For no, I don't know. All right, the next item on uh, the agenda for tonight is the code and code assignment request for ordinance update. Yes, so we, we permitted you to have a draft by the next select board meeting, and we uh, I talked to our communicated with Lisa Mann earlier tonight, okay. and she has finished her updates. Uh, Greg is on vacation. I need to look through it again. Uh, plan to do so in the coming weeks. So we we still we still are preparing to give a draft to you in two weeks. All right. And my concern, we've talked about this, is how long we've been dragging this out for COVID. COVID. Yes. So we should be able to give an answer next week. That's correct. And then we in two weeks we will have the draft here that we will be looking for. Okay. And that's what we committed to at the last meeting. Yep, yep, yep. So I put that date down on the 27th. 27th, right. Yes. And that, it will be ready. Like I said, we, uh, Lisa spent a lot of time um, adding in uh, some some points about illumination and such. Which so we just basically need to go through, correct a few, you know, kind of go through it once over, make sure that, you know, what ordinances or the correct ordinances is pointing out, so on and so forth. And then once that happens, so we will have them to do this. So I will I invite them to our meeting on the 27th. We can do that, yeah. I mean, they can look through the, I mean, we're going to be looking at the ordinance. Yeah, yeah. We have to approve the ordinance, and then we have to make a decision if we're going to, you know. No, the procedures for installing the ordinance. For a public meeting, doesn't it, an ordinance? Well, you know, that's one of the questions I'm hoping to answer. According to the gentleman, what I forget, I can't You can make a member you're talking about, Charlie. Yeah. Charlie, yeah. Charlie yeah. said we need to do that. We don't need to do that. He sent me a very interesting email about how this stuff works. It's kind of convoluted, but we can make an amendment or an addendum to the, or this ordinance, which fixes the problems without having to go to, well, we still have to give the, 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 the citizens, I think it's 30 days or 40 My days understanding days is we can pass an ordinance and if and, and present it to the, 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 the public. If they have a problem with it, then they can uh, come to us and, and challenge it. the new orders or just a, see, we're not actually writing the orders, we're just fixing the one we have. Well, no, it, I mean, it's significantly enhanced. <laughs> I mean, the other one was written in 1956. Sure. So it's not relevant. So what we, we, what we did is took the ordinance from Dover. No, what I'm asking, yeah, what so we're doing though is we're taking an ordinance and we may be doing major surgery to it. Yes. But the carcass is still the ordinance we've always had. So we don't have to generate a new, un so, new brand new ordinance. Would it be worthwhile checking with our lawyer? Well, I think it, I think we're all on the same page on this, so I'll give you more brain. But I think so basically, the because we've had a signed ordinance previously, we're now replacing that signed ordinance with an updated signed ordinance, but exactly. it's still a signed ordinance. If the public has issue with it, right. they can challenge it. That's correct. And then we would have a yeah. meeting to discuss it and, and potentially... Historically, we were talking about starting a whole other ordinance, which if it was an ordinance out of the clear blue, we'd have to go to um, a meeting day to start the whole thing. But he's correct. We've, we've had this ordinance, so we're just doing a little plastic uh, surgery. Uh, he's significantly making significant change, <laughs> yes. Okay, good. So we'll look for that. Okay, okay so yeah, we'll be there the 27th, yes. So if you'd like to invite Coda and Coda, they can read through our new ordinance and you know it's yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's significantly get impact what they want to do. Okay, excellent. Um, the next item we have is the listers um, who are not here. We're going to talk about errors and omissions. So we will um, table that until we hear from them. Everybody get their tax bill? Yeah. Yeah, I did. All right, the next item um, we have, we've been working on getting some bids for a new truck. Andy, you're up, sir. All right, uh, Keith, our road foreman, is on vacation. So he's asked me to present a couple of bids to get the ball rolling so mm -hmm. we can, uh, the one time is literally falling apart. I went over there for one reason or another this morning and how we got some work for us now. Had the whole back end part trying to put 
brake pads that it come loose again. So it's in tough shape. We know that. So anyway, Keith, he he had some. He got two bids. We like to have three, but Dodge uh, instead of going through all the uh, effort on their end, especially basically can't be so we didn't solicit a bid from them because it'd be high and they just said they can't compete with these other shows so we have two uh, and, and uh, Keith ha it favors one of them but one of them is from uh, Springfield Auto Mart for a Sierra 3500 and this bid I'm not going to drag you through the whole what it is, but the cost would be, th this first bid was $46,457. Now, they've increased. I got an updated bid on the Ford now. They've increased because of, they, the media is saying 1% for seal, and the bids, the prices have gone up like 5% since he first solicited bids. Mm -hmm. So this one from Springfield is inaccurate. It's probably uh, closer to 48 and a half or 49 now. And so you can look at it if you want. And that's not counting uh, DOT, all the registration fees. It does not include all the equipment it is. Yes. So that's a plow or a flatbed. This one goes into more depth of so what? No. What is this truck going to be used for? It's a one ton plow truck, and I think it has a dump. The body. The body. Yeah. Now, this one is the one that he's recommended mm -hmm. um, for a number of reasons. He thinks the Ford is a better truck just all around and with things like front leaf springs, a heavier metal body. They're just a better work truck. Mm -hmm. And um, straight sale price to order is forty nine thousand three hundred sixty nine dollars, and now that includes um, everything, everything we need. Mm -hmm. The Iroquois. How much was that? I didn't get it. Forty nine thousand three sixty nine. That doesn't include, include res registration. And, Whatever uh, else going on. So this had one had gone up too since he got the first bid on. That was Is that one. include the, the plow? Yes. All of the Iroquois is an outfit that puts on all of that stuff and everything is on here. I, mean, I can't read all of that. But like uh, it has the Iroquois stake platform body. Stainless steel floor and rails. I'm trying to look for some of the 42 inch high polished steel headboard. Anyway, the truck is, when we get it, it's all going to be, everything's going to be there. You know? Gotcha. Okay. And he also said that Thank you. this dealership is much, we've had good luck with them in the past. Mm. Who is and, that? Um, The dealer number. Are they I'll, local? I'll find it in Faith? Is no, I don't think so. It doesn't okay. say on here on this copy of the dealer. What's on the back? Mm -hmm. Oh, I believe it's the Cuttingsville. John C. Stewart and son, mm -hmm. Cuttingsville, Vermont. Mm -hmm. They just added on all Iroquois, the, the company that's going to add all the other stuff. They probably send it out. Yep, yeah, send the bear truck, truck over. So you buy the truck and then they, they add on all the custom stuff. Yep. Yeah. And then they give it to us. Right. I believe Keith could answer more, but another uh, thing to think about is we didn't look into. Would another hook be zero percent financing? I, we talked to Harry, and we should do the zero percent. But if there's any 
you know, financing fees that we should just pay for an outright. But, you know, here the whole breakdown is here. The original straight sale price to order is 38000 and then the Iroquois platform dump is eleven and change. And then we get, uh, I didn't know this, but municipalities, they call this less government price concession. Um, you get a discount of $6,000. Mm -hmm. And then there was another discount from the dealer. But anyway, that's what he wanted me to tell you. I'm sorry that he couldn't be here, but he feels that we should put an order in to have it by the winter. Mm -hmm. to, to do it. Do we have a clock ticking on that? No one I think so. Like he wanted if if we could vote on it tonight. Is there is there money allocated for the new truck that was budgeted? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't I can't remember how long they usually last us. And oh another thing that's a possibility that may be a trade. I was oh. talking to Hal about that and he's I said, Do you think this thing's worth anything on a trade and he kind of chuckled and he goes, well, if they take it, they'll have to resell it. So I almost thought, I heard Keith tell us that we might be able to get 1500 bucks for it or it's a mess. Yeah. He stopped to talk to me on the road the other day and you could just hear it coming to a stop like a train. Mm -hmm. So. You almost better sell it yourself. Well, I, or trade. let them take it and just get rid of it. I'm yeah. not sure how that will work. But. Am I hearing correctly that the numbers between the two companies are practically the same? At first, the Ford was cheaper, but I don't have the updated. If he asked uh, Auto Mall what they would want now, I, I would expect that they would be just a little more. More than forty nine thirty six. Well, they were forty five nine forty nine. And our Ford, the Ford was a thousand dollars less than that. So they were so very then, close. And it was before the they just put, yeah, before they put on all that yeah. extra specials. No, nope, and I'm giving you what it's going to cost us. Okay, oh. that's what I want to hear. But this is inaccurate now. The uh, thirty-five hundred steel price is gold. Well, the the Springfield bid is not current. It's gone up. Since okay. we first asked him to look into that some months ago, didn't we? It was a while ago, yeah. He's had trouble getting a, all the. Uh, but I can't, the, I can't pitch the, uh, you know, the pros and cons of the Ford versus the GM. It, but he said that we'd be much better off with the Ford. When is he coming back? My one's off for this week. I, I'm, I'm wondering if. Would two weeks make a big difference? I don't know. He seemed to want me. He asked me to present If we waited for him to come back to really talk about, I think it could. The difference. The um, yeah. the questions, of course. The, the, the bottom line is, I've used all research on these things. So the Washington chase right now, and I quite honestly am inclined to go with his experience. Well, when he told me, I couldn't write down everything he was telling me about the Ford. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm not a Ford fan myself, which is probably here. <laughs> but I know that they make a better work truck. Yeah. If you get past the F three fifty, anyone who does a lot of plowing or you know Chevy's has got GMs. I think if the cost is close to the same and Keith's making a recommendation. I'm just trying to uh, pair his recommendation the best I can. <laughs> I have some other notes too, but I guess the question that um, that's on the table right now is whether or not we need to make a decision tonight. We put it off uh, for two weeks till he comes back to firm up the numbers for sure because we feel we still yeah. got a fuzzy set of numbers yet. Right. Firm up the numbers, firm up the, the pieces. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Will right. well, two weeks make that big of difference? He seemed to think so, but yeah. Um, just another thing. Like I said, maybe a trade. They have a good relationship with the with the DLR. And Ford is uh, it's he recommended that way highly over the yeah. GM. 
So, but that four, that forty nine thousand isn't that's not the price. That is the price. That is the price. That is the yes. updated one. You just that, that, the I just got this. It was in an envelope in the office this morning. Okay. So the Ford price is the actual price. That it's the Sierra that's not updated. Right. Okay. And I don't understand if you wanted him to explain more, but I think he's going to push for the Ford just because it, it'll last longer. Usually it only is about 10 years, so. Oh. Is that one? I think that one's maybe more than 10, between think, 7 and 10 years. Yeah. But. I think it's a pretty good meeting, but it seems to me we're shooting. He likes to trade them before they're useless. Right. Well, they still got some value with them, but I understand that. I think at first, when he started looking, the trade may have been like 5,500. I don't know where I'm getting that from, but yeah. I, that almost rings a bell. So I could be off on the trade. He didn't know how that would work. Perfect. They may not be anxious to give a specific figure until they know we're you know, really part of working on it. And they take um, the edge off the registration, or I'm not sure. There's a couple, of, I'm sure there's different ways they can make that work, but they don't work, make that work until we got a, a purchaser on our lap. Yeah. yeah if you want to look at what everything it has, I mean, it's all in here. Yeah, I've looked at these a couple times, and generally in my mind, my eyes glass over here shortly. There's a lot of stuff in these things. That, that I think the, what's more impressive about the Ford is the add-ons after the dump, and yeah. the beefed up suspension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if that seems to be what you guys were thinking. I mean, it's not anything I want to go to the mat for. He just told me that this 49.369 plus DMD would be what it costs us. For everything, as far as the price, he told me that. And he's he, he's the subject expert, so he thought that I would be able to present this to you. You did by telling me what he told me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not adverse to voting on it tonight. So that we would need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. The purchase of the new truck for the amount of what, 49, 49, the truck. The Ford truck. Ford. 49,369. Yeah. yeah that's plus plus registration fees for the DMV. If you really want to know, it's a 2019 F Series SD. 2019. 19 F Series SD. 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 With the Kudermitz. Oh, so I have, a, uh, I have a motion. I'll second. We have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There are none. Motion carries. So we'll instruct Keith to pursue the Ford with our blessing. Did you want me on this road commissioner bit here? Did you want me to say something about the roads? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. A separate topic, but he's the road commissioner. So I, was, I asked Paul to put it on the. Well, I thought I could just uh, segue into it with after this that the last rains we've had especially the last Friday, we acquired a lot of damage, uh, especially in this part of the town, the southern part, particularly uh, some pretty good damage on the south end of Water Street, a couple places on South Hill, in front of the Fraser residence, in front of Rashid's house, Pikes Falls got a lot of water bars, some washouts, uh, Maori Road, to the extent where Keith thought he'd be getting a call from V-Trans, uh, figuring it was a uh, town, you know, or maybe some, some, this part of the state wide, yeah. and it was very isolated. There was some in West Dover, Dover, but we got hit pretty hard. Um, it flooded and ran into the house across the street 
street from uh, that has, that has a sign on it and let me live in the house on the side of the road. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. I, I stopped and tried to unplug the drain in the middle of that guy's lawn and tried to dig a trench so it wasn't going under his porch. But anyway, uh, at, after the Keith had, they had gone home and he, I drove over there and Keith was there calling everybody back at quarter of four. So mm. I know they worked till 6.30 or 7. They couldn't get into the pits, into the gravel pits. So they tried to make one of the roads with sand and have been trying to correct things since. We'll probably have to do a little bit of paving here and there. Yeah, so the baby was sort of you know, they still working on it. I have I have some concern that uh, I've observed on Turkey Mountain Road. Uh, first of all, I know that uh, you got a phone call from my husband about the right. this depth between our driveway and the road that has never happened before. But my concern actually is uh, going up the hill. Um, the road crew has cut way back into the property of the people who own that the um, facing the hill on the left hand side to the point where I would estimate they've gone at least 20 to sometime 25 feet into the land and uh, in order for drainage coming down our hill, which is an eight degree hill. And I'm wondering whether, in fact, uh, the road crew ever got permission to cut into that depth of property, because I know that the roads are 50 feet wide, 25 from the center and out, including the uh, little bit of the, what do you call that? Island, not the island, the, the shoulder. The shoulder. And this is way back going into their property. And uh, I'm, I'm concerned about intrusion into uh, the land, uh, whether we have the right to do that. I don't know. I haven't seen it, but I would, you I would assume that they. Are ditching and trying. That was probably a mess up there too. It was a mess. Yeah. But some of the ditching actually is not even properly done because the flow is coming down, and in the back of this large ditch, it goes up. So there's not a natural flow down. And in the one piece of property I'm talking about, they have four of these huge ditches mm -hmm. that are at least 10 to 12 feet, maybe even 15 feet wide mm -hmm. going in. So I don't know whether they have... Do you have the address for that property? Uh, it's the one right next to us. So I'm 1905, so they're beyond that. Yeah, okay. But it might be worthwhile looking No one up there today and uh, fix your driveway? No. They're going to. Oh, okay. Uh, but th I'm really more concerned, well, I am concerned about what happened to us, but uh, the amount of distance they've gone into private land to ditch. It's usually pretty good with the right of way, but that's something to look into. Yeah. To look at. We do know that, that this ditching is, is, is mandated by the state. Right. And that they're, they're doing the best they can to meet the uh, state requirements. And I'm not sure what he may have to do to do that. I yeah, don't know. that's, and, and that's really where my question, do we have the right to go into sure. private land that far? It, it should be right away issues, but that should be something we can look at just to see. I really, I'll go up and look, but uh, until the landowner or, you know, I'll talk to Keith when he gets back. But I, Really don't know what to yeah. say about that. Yeah, I don't either. That's why I'm and he may have, really he may have been, it up. He may have communicated with the land. Yeah, he may have. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have anything else? No, there's probably some. Uh, um, well, I got in my truck and was driving around different roads, uh, like every road I could find, and it was north of here. It was much few water bars and nothing too outrageous.
But it, if it rained for another hour, we would have been in some yeah. pretty big trouble. And, uh, so it was pavement water. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, there was some places the pavement buckled. I, the water was washing in between pavement at the end of uh, Water Street. Mm -hmm. it just was the, the mm -hmm. drain was overwhelmed. Yeah. I think it's important, and I'm glad you bring it up, that this is isolated from different spots because there are places down the road, five miles, get nothing. And other yeah. places were clobbered. So what you're looking at in your front door may not be reflective of how much work these guys have to do. First time I've ever seen it, like I was in Townsend involved in something down there. My phone was giving these uh, flash flood warnings mm -hmm. for Jamaica. I've never heard my phone do that before. It gave three in about 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, no one I got here. Because it would it reverse, what they call it, reverse 911? I don't know when they, call oh, you. when they call you. No, but yeah. they're putting out. This was just on a phone. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yes, and we, some of us had flash floods, didn't some of us? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next one to discuss the survey of the water project, I would like to make a pitch. I talked to um, Christy Haskins today. As of today, They've received 19, uh, 18 responses. They sent out 62 surveys. She's got 18 responses for a total of 30%. Um, two return for incorrect addresses. Online, the online um, application, or online uh, survey, she had 21 responses for that. So, um, she would like anybody who has not turned those in yet to send them in as soon as possible because they want to get moving on, on, the, on the water testing. Which brings up another, the water quality testing, which um, is, they're offering. Um, if she can get anybody who's interested in that by the 20th, which is next Monday, then they're going to select which ones get the free water testing by where they're located. But they're going to do that from the people who have asked for the free water testing. So if any of you have the uh, surveys out, please send them in. And if you're interested in having water quality testing, get them in before Monday the 20th, which is next Monday. And then she will put you on the list and, and um, gather some, some information about the water testing. Is that testing anywhere in town or just in no, the, it's Main, in the Street. Main Street section because they're trying to find out what our water problems are. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see if there's anything else that she wanted me to bring up. Okay, the next item we have. Um, and you have any questions about the water thing? No, yes. Can I? Can I? I have something else to, to say too. Oh, but after the water thing, no. Okay. Well, the water thing is now officially done. Okay. okay. So uh, Sarah and I worked on the website last week, um, and we've changed the format. We made it go from black to white because we felt it was more friendly looking and, and better looking. Um, also, we've added a community calendar on there, and. It's not only for events in town, or it's not only for events from the town, but also events in town. So um, if there are community organizations that have events they want to put on it, you can send an email to the town clerk at Jamaica, and she said she would add them on there. Mm -hmm. So there's things on there from Jamaica Community Arts, um, you know, tax deadlines, um, uh, school start dates, those types of things. I, I'll talk with the uh, Jamaica Rec Committee and find out when their sign-ups are for sports. But the whole thought behind it is that it's a community calendar where people can go on the, the JamaicaVermont.org website and find out about events. So we're hoping to keep it up to date. And again, Sarah said she would take, take on that task of adding new events to it. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. It's a big improvement. I, I went on there today. Like tonight, I was like, if we, whether I was going to come down or not, we'd never check up. You can have it. Right here. Right? <laughs> With the old days, it would have been back in like you know March the twentieth. <laughs> well, so we we've, we've made some progress to update it, things too with videos and such. The town meeting videos we put on there, the select board videos have been updated. So we've gone back through to try to keep it up to date. We had a a a, uh, a complaint from a resident last last meeting that it was falling behind and it wasn't useful. So we tried to make steps to make it more useful. So. If, if you can go out to the site, and we should, we're going to try to keep it up to date and try to keep it relevant. Thank you very much. Yes. Next item, time for public concerns. Do we have any public or concern? We have a, she's pointing to you, I assume that means you're up. <laughs> My, first of all, with the, with the truck. First of all, before, uh, to identify yourself. I'm sorry, I'm Dan Cummins. 
have a couple of questions. Uh, the truck, do we oil undercoat any of our vehicles? Yes. Next question. Good. Uh, second one was about the, uh, the town hall. You know, from being with the, associated with some of the theater productions and that recently, uh, we need to put some money in that building. Yes. I'm, I'm sure you guys are probably, you know, aware of that. I know that the, from just being in there and looking up at that ceiling, I've done painting before, and that, that took some work painting that ceiling, and it's, there's leaks or paint peeling from it, which maybe means that there's a leak in the roof, which is like, that's paramount in any building where you've got to have a good roof, otherwise we're going to just end up incurring more damage. Sure. I mean, that's where we go for meetings. And so I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> okay, so, so anyway, so the roof, the roof needs attention. The ceiling, you know, needs attention. Also, the, uh, uh, the floor. You know, the floor in that place, I mean, it's a beautiful floor, and yet it's just dusty and dirty all the time. It, needs, it should be refinished in a manner where it's going to sustain some traffic and just make it overall just look look better. The outside, like the, uh, that needs some attention too, but I think that the roof is really important. The lights, I have it on here, it says lights need attention. That's one of my little things, whatever time is, the always has to come fix it, but you know, the lights have a mind of their own in that place. And we had a concert, a couple of, uh, two concerts back or whatever, and uh, you, you weren't there, and just for some reason, whatever, the spot just decided to just go out. And then partway through the, pres the, the presentation, it came back on again. <laughs> and we saw, you know, then the lights began to stage. You know, what do they call that? Goblins or yes, something? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so the point is, though, is that with, with all that stuff not working correctly at all, all the time, indicates we could have some wiring problems back there. A wiring problem would burn down the building and, you know, in a flash. So those are things that we need to, to start looking at because that's a, that's a big investment down there. That's also something that we can, that brings in money, that brings in business to the town and shows. So, plus we need it for our meetings. So I will put my, I'm going to take off my stuff and hat and put on the Arts Council hat. We did send an email, and I'm sorry I didn't include you on the stand. We sent, we, we came up with a list of hat, and I came up with a list of things, many of them which you spoke of, right. and we forwarded that along to, to the select board to say these are things that Jamaica Community Arts, per our meeting earlier in the year, these are the things that we've come across, and then some of it was small things like windows need cleaned, like the floor needs refinished, at least waxed, um, to the bigger issues around roof problems or paint peeling and those types of things, or the sill, the back sill supposedly is rotting out. So. So we addressed it, and with that, I'll give it to Judy so she can talk about it. Okay. But we did send the letter over to them, and she did respond to me to prioritize, and I, I haven't gotten back to prioritize. Yeah, basically, that's what I've done. Uh, the $20,000 that was put into the budget this year was basically uh, to address the three issues that the uh, Preservation Committee had sent to us. So even though we have $20,000, what that is supposed to be for are three things, which is the back wall of the uh, building to be painted, the outside exterior, uh, the roof, which is what you're talking about, and uh, also some gutter work. So, uh, but from what I have uh, Andy actually has done some looking for me at the uh, and I actually have been asking to have a uh, uh, what do you call that when you send out a RFP? request for yeah, yeah. Uh, to and I don't know because I've been on vacation I don't know whether that was ever sent out for the roof uh, or for the painting for yes for those three things. Okay. So I have not gotten anything back yet. I know uh, Terry was working on those things. Okay, okay. Uh, and then I wrote a letter back to Tom saying that I would like to have those things prioritized. However, the money of the 20,000 is for the three specific ones, and we need to start looking at 
getting some money in the budget so that we can begin to do some of the other things for the building. And we need to keep that up. And with the work that you're doing and uh, with all the theater s stuff that's going on, it's great. And we need to keep that up and to be able to uh, continue the programs that you are all working so hard on. So that's where it stands. Uh, and I, as I said, to prioritize. Uh, so we, yeah, yeah, right, right. I know. <laughs> Um, to begin. So I'm aware of all that you are finding mm -hmm. uh, that needs to be done. And I think there's two different things to look at. There's structural problems with the building, which right. are serious, and then there's things like the floor. Right. It doesn't look good. It's dingy. It's right. dirty. It can, yeah, and it I should know. be, and it should be <laughs> right. refinished or, or, or at least waxed and made look right. made look well. But um, is, is that a high priority if the roof's paving in? Right. Probably not. So. Right. Yeah. Um, so okay. And the leak, the leaks in the in the roofing. Yeah. I think is that slate? There are a couple. Of, yeah, it's slate. It's slate. So it's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, so that's where we're at with that. It's fixable. What was that? It's fixable. Yeah, and we just have to really kind of concentrate on trying to get some money and trying to get these other things done that are required in order to keep our A1 uh, authorization as a, a historic building. Are you going to check with Terry on the RFP? Yes, I will. Okay. Check on that. And those people that determine that uh, A1 status, do they have? Money? No. <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> but do they have an idea what should be, what's a priority? or? Do they, did they look at buildings and uh, no, they, that critical uh, eye? All I got was a listing of the three things that are that need to be done. Right. So I would think that the sill, that if, if I understand how things work, right. which I'm not a builder, I think the sill probably needs to be first. Mm -hmm. And the roof, well, a good close second, if not first and second. So I've looked at the back of that building to, and I, don't, I don't believe it needs to be painted. I, think I, it I, I, I agree shot. with you on that they, one, too. They, they, just, they, they said that. Yeah, they that. said I that. Don't that think that's, the best, they, that's the best sign. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's I mean, what they it, said. It's, it's, and if the paint's not feeling, I don't know what they're saying. It's right. painted and the paint's not feeling, so... <laughs> exactly. I, I and know. I agree with both of you. I don't know where that's coming from. Uh, but we do have two other things that I think yeah. definitely need attention. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other? If not, we have um, you have an executive session for personnel issue. You want a second? I move to find the premature general public knowledge of this personnel issue, including placing the individual involved at a substantial disadvantage. I'll give this to you tomorrow. <laughs> Just the fingers are going really to the test. Um, because, this, um, because the select board must discuss individual issues if it discusses the, um, those issues in public. So I make the move right a second. Second. Do I have any further discussion? Very good. That has passed. I have a question. Um, am, I, am I concerned with this? No. Not at all. No, you're on for next week, or next okay. session. I understand that the uh, original commission meeting is on the 28th. I understand it. Yeah. You made that clear last week. Okay. And it'll be on that. Okay. All right. Um, I now move that we enter into executive session to discuss a particular personnel issue under the provisions of Title I, Section 313A1A of the law statute. Do I have a second? Second. Then any further discussion? Hearing none, we will pause for um, the camera folk to exit. You do not need to stick around. Because we will not, we will not be conducting this this afternoon. Huh? Huh? No. Oh well, you yeah, have voted on going into executive session. Yes. Oh, uh, so you do. We are going into executive session. That's correct. Does she have to? She has to announce. No. No. No.
no, no, what I'm saying is you don't need to stay around because we're not going to be doing it. I understand, but you seconded, but you had to vote it. Oh, we didn't vote to go to the executive session? Again? All favor? Aye. 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 Aye